Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, this talk. It's not the first one that we offer in this series, but it's the first talk that we provide on one of the two policy areas um, we're concentrating on in this semester. So today it's going to be about food and the environment. And it's a great pleasure for us to have today Professor Morone, who came from Rome today to give this talk. Uh, Professor Morone is an expert in the field. Um, he's conducting research on uh, green economy, on uh, sustainable development, and on, on innovation. So, um, of course, he has uh, uh, a lot of information that he can give us uh, on the topic, uh, especially because uh, he's working on international projects, and so um, he's comparing today uh, the situation in the European Union that is uh, what we're most interested in with the situation in the United States. Uh, so this is conducive to uh, the field trip we will have in Brussels at the end of the month when we will meet with practitioner in the field of environmental policy and food protection. So we thank Professor Morone for being here today, for giving us um, all the information that is necessary in order to get ready for uh, our field trip in Brussels. Thank you again, and I Thanks, leave the Steve. floor to you. Thank you, Nicolò. It's a great pleasure to be here in this uh, wonderful setting. Uh, it's my first time in this, uh, on this uh, beautiful hill and of course in Villa La Pietra. And um, Nicolò has been very kind in introducing me as a specialist on uh, food uh, um, issues. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm an economist and uh, I've, been I've been working for the last uh, seven years and a half on food waste valorization. I will give you today a talk on some of the most uh, recent uh, development of this uh, research area uh, trying to make, uh, a, trying to uh, uh, set it within a general theoretical framework, uh, although it will be presented in a very uh, stylized way. Uh, so just to give you an idea, a glance of what, we are, what, what are the key theoretical issues underneath uh, the debate. And then I will try to give you also um, some uh, hints on the transatlantic divide as we put it in the title, because as you will see, there are some kind of differences between the European approach and the United States of America approach to the general issue of sustainability transition. This is a new word for you probably uh, that you hear for the first time today in this talk, but we will get back to this word quite a, quite a few times during my talk, and uh, I will try to uh, make it clear to you all what, it, what, it, what exactly um, analysts and uh, researchers mean by sustainability transition. So let's get started with some uh, historical facts. Uh, don't get scared about the graphs and the, and, the, and the figures, which are quite easy, and I will explain them to you in uh, some details now. This is uh, uh, basically, these waves are called long waves, and they were introduced back in uh, 1925, so almost 100 years ago, by an, a Russian uh, economist called Nikolai Kondratiev, who first introduced this uh, uh, concept of long waves. This long wave concept has been then developed by several economists uh, and uh, uh, scientists, in order, and, they, um, and uh, the one that we'll be referring to is uh, the interpretation that uh, uh, the Austrian economist uh, uh, Joseph Alois Schumpeter gave about, uh, uh, gave about these uh, uh, long waves. So the idea underneath the long wave theory is that uh, economic history is characterized by these uh, long waves, which last approximately between 50 to 60, 65 years, and are characterized by an upswing, which is corresponding to the prosperity, the prosperity, prosperity period. And then we have an apex, a climax of this wave, which turns, uh, gives the way to, the, uh, to the, the downswing, where we have recession, depression, and eventually recovery. So the interpretation of uh, Schumpeter of conductive waves relates to technological change. It's basically making, establishing a link between major technological shift 
paradigm shift, we could say, and the long wave, the phases of the, of the long wave, the upswing phase, the downswing phase. Uh, Schumpeter identified, following the, the theory of contrast, they have identified basically three long waves. The first one, which was associated to the, the, the introduction into the economy of the steam engine and the cotton industry, which is basically going back to the first industrial revolution, which started at the end of the 18th century and lasted for approximately 60 to 65 years. Then there was a second wave, which was uh, uh, associated to the introduction into the economy of railway and steel industry which lasted until uh, the, 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 the second half of the, 19, of the uh, 19th century. Then there was a third wave identified by uh, Schumpeter himself, which is associated to electrical engineering and chemistry industry. Then subsequently, another couple of waves have been identified by other scholars, which are the petrochemical and automobile uh, uh, wave, so wave associated with the introduction of the, the, the development of the petrochemical industry and the automobile sector. And then finally, there is the fifth wave, which is associated to the introduction into the economy of the so-called information and communication technologies, the ICTs. So basically the idea is that we have a, a period of uh, uh, prosperity which is associated to the introduction of a new technology, which if you look at uh, the, the studies on technological diffusion and innovation diffusions, corresponds to the first period where you have the bulk of uh, people adopting the new technology. Think about mobile phones, for example. Okay, this is an example which is very close to your experience. At the beginning, when the mobile phone entered into the market, there was a very small minority of people uh, having a mobile phone. This, was, this is called the innovators, within, which is uh, basically adds up to 2%, two, two less than 3% of the population. These are innovators. These are the, the kind of people that are really keen on new technologies, on new innovation, and they are willing to take a risk but they are adopting the new technology uh, as, uh, as, uh, um, as a pioneers. Then we have a phase in which there is a, a big majority of people entering to this market, and this is called the early adopters followed by the early majority and the late majority. You see here the, the distribution, basically this is telling you how many people have adopted the new technology, is going up very fast, okay? And this is corresponding to the prosperity phase. And when the market starts getting saturated, then you enter into the recession and slowly into the, the, uh, the depression. And then eventually, when there is a new technology entering into the market and replacing the, 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 the old technology, not replacing, but let's say taking the central, the core uh, point in the economy, the core area in the economy, uh, then you have a chance to go back into a recovery phase and then again the upswing and downswing. Okay? So this is basically how you, we have these uh, wa long waves. So these long waves are somehow associated to the diffusion process of a new technology. And as we said, we have so far, uh, scholars ag are agreeing on uh, five waves, okay? There are five long waves that have been identified in the economic history, starting from the first industrial revolution, of course. Now, the question that we will try to address today is whether we are heading or not towards a sixth quantitative wave, okay? And if so, which kind of wave is it gonna be? In order to address this question, we go back to quantitative himself, who identified five key mechanisms, five key characteristics of a change that leads to the new long cycle. These are the exhaustion of an older innovation, the excess of financial capital in the economy, a period of severe recession leading to depression, social and institutional transformation, and new technologies at the horizon able to overcome the microeconomic bottlenecks. Now we'll go through all these points, these key mechanisms, in order to see whether the actual, the, the actual economic situation that we are in today is actually leading us towards a sixth quantitative wave. And if so, which kind of wave is it gonna be? So let's start from the beginning. 
the potential uh, is, is are we heading towards the exhaustion, the exhaustion of the potential of the old technology, the technology that is leading the fifth, uh, the fifth uh, wave. As we said, the fifth wave is uh, uh, associated with the ICT revolution, the introduction of uh, information and communication technologies into the economies, computers, the internet, and so on and so forth. So are we really heading towards a reduction into the profit associated, the marginal profit, the margin uh, of, of, uh, that you can make on this, uh, on this uh, new technology? Well, it's quite interesting, this issue, because uh, it has attracted over time the attention of a lot of uh, uh, researchers, economists, and political scientists. Because in the, 19, uh, in, in the 80s, the Nobel Prize winner, Robert Solo, uh, made a statement that was uh, kind of uh, provocative at the time. And he was saying that uh, you can see computers everywhere but on the productivity statistics. This was called the Solo Paradox. So there is a huge diffusion already in the 80s of computers, but there is no impact, measurable impact, on productivity. Why is it so? So basically this was a, like a paradox, attracting the attention of a lot of researchers. And uh, they started uh, investigating this paradox, and a uh, lot of uh, uh, research pointed that uh, at the time when Solo was making the statement, the link between uh, the introduction of these information and communication technologies and productivity was very slim, but it was, this was due to several uh, issues. First of all, the data collected were not highly reliable. Uh, second, there was a lag, a lag problem, because in order to have an impact for this kind of complex technology, which is affecting, uh, these are called uh, uh, general purpose technologies. So these are kind of technology which are affecting the production world in a, a lot of different areas. So in order to get an impact on productivity, you really, it really takes time, okay? It's not just taking a computer and putting it on, on the desk, on a desk that you get an impact on productivity. You have to rethink the whole firm for instance, in order to have significant and measurable impact on productivity. So basically there, was, uh, uh, there were some problems that were highlighted by researchers and uh, uh, eventually they started pointing at a significant impact of an ICT upon uh, productivity statistics. And uh, what we can see now is that the strong, this strong relation between ICT and productivity is now getting to a plateau, is now getting to basically a situation which is slowing, is slowing down, okay? So basically the study, most up-to-date study are telling us that the productivity, the, the impact on productivity of the old, of the, of the technology that, which led the fifth conjunctive wave, the fifth long wave, is probably getting to uh, exhaustion. The second issue, is there a high level of excess financial capital? Well, if you think uh, that uh, the real economy, what is worth the real economy, which is 63 trillion of dollars, uh, is uh, one-tenth of what is worth the financial derivatives economy, then probably you can agree with me that we do have an excess of financial capital in this, uh, uh, in this moment in time, in the, in, the, in the economy as we know it today. And probably it's also uh, a self-explained uh, fact if you look at the, 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 the causes of this uh, financial crisis started in 2007-2008. The third issue, are we into a period of getting, are we into a period of severe uh, recession and leading to a depression? Well, probably yes, I would say. This is the GDP data. Uh, what we can see is that there was, by all, by all means, there was a strong uh, recession starting in 2008. The world GDP is going down very fast, okay? Then there is a recovery phase, but the so-called V-shaped recovery, which is uh, a situation in which we have a slump and then go up again to the original level, is not really occurring. Because after the recovery, the GDP, the world GDP, kept going down. Okay, so this is suggesting us that what we really are into is not just a recession, but it's actually depression, which is a much long-term, it's, it's a long-term phenomenon as compared to recession, which is a short-term phenomenon. So basically, 
we probably are heading are, are into a, a severe recession or depression phase. And this is even more true if you look at the data uh, divided by a different income level across countries. This is very much the case for European countries. It's also the case for, uh, generally speaking, uh, high income countries. It's less the case for countries uh, which are uh, the, the, the so-called BRICS, Within the BRICS, we have also to make uh, differences because uh, China and India are growing, uh, are still growing now, but uh, Brazil and Russia are going into a new phase of uh, recession. So basically, I would say that yes, we are probably uh, getting out now, probably very slowly, but we have been going through a phase of severe recession slash depression. Now, the fourth question, are there some social and institutional big transformations? The first thing that came to my mind to answer this question is the demographic transition. What is going to happen in terms of world population over the next 20, 25 years? If you look at the data uh, and forecast made by uh, several uh, international organizations like uh, FAO and uh, United Nations, so on and so forth, then we can say that uh, we are all agreeing that the world population is going to grow by another 2 billion people over the next 25 years. So by, 2000 and, uh, by 2050, sorry, 35 years. By 2050, the world population will, be, will reach the level of more than 9 billion people. Now we are slightly more than 7 billion people. Over the next 35 years, the world population is going to grow by another 2 billion people. And where is it going to be concentrated, this growth, this population growth? It's going to be concentrated mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, so the lowest income area of the world, of the planet, but it's also going to be concentrated in low-middle income countries. Very little of this growth is going to happen in high income countries. Europe, as you probably know, is close to zero in terms of demographic growth. So basically, this is suggesting the occurrence of uh, a lot of uh, associated issue. And uh, as an economist, I want to point out that this one, but we will get back to also to other problems associated with the demographic transition. Huh? Keep, it, keep this, uh, this figure in mind. We'll get back to this. But uh, indeed, another interesting uh, change ahead of us is, this, this is the so-called phenomenon of the explosion of the middle class. By middle class, we mean families, households, which have an income in the brackets between $6,000 and $30,000 per day. Uh, so per, per year. Per day would be, that would be great, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Italian professors uh, are very rich people, so we, uh, we have uh, different... Uh... Anyway, so these are, uh, this is the income of uh, per year per household. Uh, what does it mean? And uh, how many people are going to get into these income brackets? Roughly half of the world population by 2050 will fall within, will fall within these income brackets, which means 4 billion people will be middle income, middle income uh, families. Okay? What does it mean? It means that they will start, that, that there will be a sharp increase in the demand of processed food. There will be a sharp increase in terms of demand for manufactured goods. And probably there will be also increase in uh, civil rights, wealth and civil rights, okay? So yes, there are indeed big social and institutional transformation ahead of us. We will get back also to the impact of this uh, economic uh, growth uh, on uh, other environmental issues like associated with the demand of food, the demand of manufactured goods, and so on, okay? So, the fourth issue that we have to address in order to understand and provide, try to provide an answer to our original question, whether we are heading or not towards a four, a fifth, a sixth quantitative wave, is whether there are new technologies able to overcome the microeconomic bottlenecks. But in order to answer this question, we really need to answer another question, which is uh, what are the 21st century bottlenecks? What can we call the bottlenecks? 
of the century that we are, in, that we are living in. As I see it, they are associated to the macro uh, mega trends we've been discussing so far. As we said, the world population is going to grow by 2 billion people over the next 35 years. And most of this concentration, the bulk of this, of this growth, is going to be in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which means basically there's going to be an increase in the demand for food by nearly 35%. Okay, this is a big increase. If you think about, think about it, nowadays we have 7 billion people living in the planet, and we have roughly 900 million people which are in a condition of uh, undernourishment or starvation, okay? So roughly one billion people doesn't have enough food to survive, okay? So what's going to be this, what, 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 what is going to happen when another two billion people are going to populate the planet and these other two billion people are going to be concentrated in the poorest area of the world? We have to take, to take responsibility for this. We have to start thinking about this. So this is, by all means, I think, one of the biggest issues we will have to face over the next years. Second issue, explosion of middle class, we said, which means basically a sharp increase in the world GDP, okay? Now we know that there is a strong correlation between the GDP level and the emissions in terms of CO2 emissions, okay? So if we keep producing in the same way that we are producing today, but we satisfy the demand of the growing world population, okay? So if we are assuming that we are going on a business as usual path, we will end up having an increase of, in terms of CO2 emission, which is by several uh, analysts is considered to be unsustainable in terms of greenhouse gases effects and global warming. We'll get back to the global warming issue, okay? There are some uh, scenario analysis which are telling us what we should be, be doing in order to revert this path, but uh, if we consider a business as usual, as usual scenario, the amount of CO2 which is going to be produced is going to be unsustainable. Why? Because of course, as we said, if uh, the average family in China is going to have uh, an income anywhere in between $6,000 and $30,000 per year, there is no reason to believe that they will not ask the kind of goods that we are asking, that we are demanding, okay? So the demand is going to be similar to European and American demand. So we will have to produce this kind of goods, okay? And if we produce them on a business as usual technology, then we're going to have an increase in CO2 emissions, which is unsustainable. Cars, mobile phone, computers, all these goods are going to be purchased by these people that are going to become middle class. There are some economists that are talking about degrowth and I, well, I, although I, uh, I, um, I like some, some, some of their explanations, I have to say that I don't buy this uh, theory. Why? Because I think that we cannot ask people which are living in uh, low and medium uh, uh, income countries not to fulfill their desire to get access to the same kind of goods and wealth that we have now, okay? It's their aspiration, and there is no way that we can ask them not to do this, okay? So if we want them, we want to reduce their expectation of growth, but we want to keep on a degrowth path, then the GDP of the United States has to reduce by six times, okay? Do you think this is possible? I don't. I don't think that we can ask our kids our, the future generation to live with less than what we've been living with. If I think about my son and my daughter, I think that they will have the same kind of demand that I do have. They will need smartphones, 
they will need computers. But probably what should be different is the approach that they have to these kind of goods. So when my mobile phone uh, gets to end of life, I throw it away. This is not sustainable. Probably they will have to return it to, a new, to another firm, which is de-engineering the, the, the product and taking out all the materials that are inside. Why? Because we have two other issues that I, we, have, we need to discuss. One is associated to the food, the demand of food, and the amount of waste that we are producing. Okay? So if we want to feed all the population that will be populating the world over the next years, we have to face also a problem associated with the amount of waste. Okay? There are some interesting figures about where the waste is produced okay, across the supply chain okay, of food production. And as a matter of fact, as the income level goes up, the amount of food waste increases, and especially increases at the end of the supply chain, consumers. Okay? In the United States, 60% of the food waste of the food of the food waste is wasted at the consumer level, in the families, in the households. In Africa, in sub-Saharan African region, this adds up only to 5%. Okay? Most of the waste in these countries occurs at the pre-harvesting, harvesting, transportation phases of the supply chain. Okay? So basically, we, there are big issues that we have to consider and to face if we think that the world population is going to grow, if you think that the, 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 the middle class is going to explode, and if you think that we will, ne we will find, we need to find a way to feed these people. And the other issue is related to material. This is a, a table of materials provided by the Royal Chemistry Society. And what this table is telling us is that there are several materials, which are those in red, which are going to finish completely over the next 100 years. If we keep them using at the same pace as we're using them today, over the next 50, 70 years, there will be some materials, like zinc and others, that we will not have anymore. They will just be not there anymore, on this planet anymore. That's why I was telling you that probably the, the mobile phone of my son will need to be returned to a new firm that will be dismantled it and take, recover all materials. Okay? So we need a different approach to waste consumption. Anyway, just to make a long story short, the question I started with is, are we heading towards a six conservative wave? Now I would say that my answer is probably yes. We are heading towards a six conservative wave. We have examined all the five mechanisms identified by Kondratiev. And I think that we can confidently say that, yes, we are probably heading towards a sixth wave. And it's going to be a sustainability wave. Okay? So the key technologies associated with this new wave have to be technologies which are meant to increase the sustainability. That's when we start talking about sustainability transition. So we have to make a transition from an old paradigm, which is the actual paradigm we're living in nowadays, which is basically a paradigm based on uh, uh, fossil fuel, towards a new, par a new paradigm, a new type of economy, which is the bio-based economy. Okay? So I think that this is going to be the key, the buzzword of the sixth conservative wave. Okay? So we really need to make a shift, a paradigm shift. We have to make a transition towards sustainability, which will bring us from a fossil fuel-based economy to one based on bio products, bio uh, economy. What does it mean? It means basically that we will be using more and more uh, bio products, inputs coming from, not from, from the um, uh, petrol, but from uh, biomasses in order to produce the same kind of things that we are producing today. Even more, we can use bio waste to produce the kind of things that nowadays we are producing with fossil fuel. 
We can make plastic with biomasses. When you go to a supermarket today, you end up with a, a shopper which is made with bioplastic. Okay? Did you, did you realize that? All over in Italy, supermarkets have to sell you, have to give you uh, shoppers made of bioplastic. What does it mean? What is bioplastic? It's a plastic which is made with, this is big, it's a big question what, what exactly bioplastic is. We could talk until tomorrow about this. Uh, but anyway, it's a plastic which is biodegradable, okay? The idea is that we should start making polymers from carbon, eh, from fossil fuel, we should make them with biomasses, okay? Which means basically that we can do them with products that, are, uh, that have an impact in terms of CO2, which is balanced, okay? Because when you are using uh, fossil fuel, you are, in order to process this fossil fuel, you are um, producing uh, an amount of CO2 which is not balanced by the production of biomasses. Because this is where biomasses produces ooh, so many years ago, which is unbalancing now the amount of CO2 that you have in the environment. But if you do polymers using biomasses, then you have a balance in terms of CO2 emission and CO2 captured by these biomasses. So we, have to, we can do all sorts of things using biomasses. But even more interesting for me, and this is my area of research over the, la over the last few years, is that you can do these kind of things with waste. For example, we were, I was talking to you about the shoppers. Most of the shoppers nowadays, uh, bioplastic shoppers, are made with uh, corn, okay? Dedicated crops, corn, which is used to make the polymer uh, biodegradable. You could do exactly the same, and probably even better, using waste, food waste, okay? There's no reason not to use food waste and use a landfill for growing dedicated crops when you can use bio-waste. You can use food waste to do this. So, I think that the sixth wave is going to lead us towards a transition towards sustainability. What does it take to have uh, this kind of transition? There is a, a new area of research which started in the early uh, year of this century, which talks about uh, sustainability transition. It started with uh, the so-called socio-technical transition, and then developed a branch of it, developed into the sustainability transition paradigm. What does it mean? It means basically, this theory, what is it, this theory telling us? It's trying to provide uh, an explanation on how this kind of transition can occur. In order to, uh, to have uh, a socio-technical transition or a sustainability transition to occur, you need basically to kick out an existing paradigm, the so-called dominant regime, dominant technological or socio-technological regime. Okay? You need to get rid of this dominant socio-technological regime. But this is not an easy task at all. Why? Because a dominant socio-technological regime is by all means a very stable configuration. Why? Because over the years, eh, if you think about it, 60, 60 years that we have more, more uh, that we're using uh, cars uh, that are using uh, uh, petrol. If you think about it, this is really making a, a stable configuration, okay? Because we have infrastructures which are meant to serve this socio-technological regime. We have regulation that are designed around the, socio the dominant socio-technological regime. We have technologies, incremental innovation, which have been produced around the, social the dominant socio-technological regime. We have initial sunk investments, which cannot be recovered. Competences of people you know, working with this, the dominant socio-technological regime. So in order to withdraw this socio-technological regime and switch to a new sustainable regime, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of things to happen all at the same time.
The core idea of this model, which is called multi-level perspective, because you have three levels, you have a macro level, you have a meso level, which is the regime level we've been talking about now, and then we have a micro level, which is the niche innovation level. So the core idea of this multi-level perspective is that in order to have a shift, in order to have a transition from an old social technological regime to a new, more sustainable social technological regime, you need to have some kind of pressure coming from the landscape level, and we will talk, discuss about this landscape concept. So you need to get some sufficient amount of pressure coming from the landscape level, which has to be aligned with pressure coming from the innovation niche level. Okay? If you have the alignment of sufficient pressure coming from the landscape level, from the macro level, the policy level, all sorts of big things are occur at the macro level. But we will get back to this. And then you also have a new niche technology, which is sufficiently developed in order to replace the existing technology, then you really get a chance to have a transition. Okay? What we want, of course, is a sustainable transition. So what we want is that a new, more sustainable technology, which has developed at the niche level, can replace the dominant technological regime. So basically the idea is that you need pressure from the macro level. This pressure from the macro level will open up what, they've, what in this literature are called windows of opportunities, okay? Anytime there is sufficient pressure coming from the landscape level, there is the opening up of a window of opportunity. And if there is a technological niche which is sufficiently developed, then this will be able to make the turn, to make the shift, okay? There are several examples in the literature about this. Think about the transition from uh, uh, boats uh, uh, going with the wind, no, sailing boats, uh, uh, in the 18th century, to uh, power um, steam engine uh, powered uh, boats, okay? There were a lot of things that were designed for uh, uh, sailing boats, okay? The routes of trade just to say one. The ports were designed for this kind of boat, okay? It wasn't easy to make a change, to make a transition, but it did occur, okay? So it's not impossible to have a transition, this kind of transition. But there was a new technology which was there, which was developed in a niche, which was sufficiently developed, okay? And there were pressure coming from the political uh, point of view because the, the geopolitical equilibrium were changing, okay? Was, uh, this was exerting pressure in order to introduce this new technology, and then it did happen. In the same way, we can have other transitions, okay? So basically, the idea is that you need to have this alignment of a pressure coming from the top and a pressure coming from the bottom. I've been working on this concept and um, looking at, uh, initially, I've been looking at uh, the niche, the micro level, the niche, the technological niche level. The question I've been trying to address is the following. What does it take for a technological niche to become mature, sufficiently mature? What does it mean? And we provided, uh, me with some colleagues, we provided some answers, and we started looking at uh, the key mechanisms that are making a technology, that can make a technological niche mature, and we identified, along with other people in, the, in this uh, stream of literature, we identified three key mechanisms. One is knowledge. You need to have uh, sufficient knowledge about this new technology and has to be shared by the majority of people operating on this technology. So there is learning. There is the need for learning processes. You need networking, the so-called networking mechanism, which is basically involved in the presence, the, the, the definition of a, a sufficiently developed social network of people that believes and operates for this technological niche. And then you need expectation, the convergence of expectations. People have to start trusting, believing into this new technology, okay? Only if there is a growing number of people that believe that a change is possible and this technology is really going to make uh, the difference, then you can get to a niche which is sufficiently developed. 
So we did this uh, uh, investigation and we studied uh, some technological niche. What I want to talk to you about today is the macro level and with this will lead us to the end of my presentation which is about uh, the transatlantic divide. And uh, I want to, my, my effort now in this area of research is devoted to understand exactly what is the landscape level. What is actually occurring at the landscape level? Who are the, the subjects, uh, the actors that are acting at the landscape level and are exerciting this kind of pressure? And how they are exerciting this kind of pressure on the socio-technological dominant regime? We've been identifying two different types of agents, which are global actors, multinational organization, uh, sovereign national uh, organization, and so on, and local actors, like grassroots organization, local stakeholders. And we said that these uh, two, two, two different types of actors uh, are exercising their pressure through two different channels. One is the economic channel, and the other one is the political channel. Now, let's go to the question of, uh, the final question of this uh, talk. Why European attitude to tackling climate change differs so much from the Americans? This is a big question, and I think that can be studied using this uh, framework I've been depicting to you so far. Just a few data. Europeans think that the climate change and the threat of global warming is, a more, is one of the more serious problems uh, that we're facing. It's even more serious than the financial turmoil. These are data collected on a, through a survey. Europeans consider the climate change as the second biggest threat which the world faces, second only to the world hunger and, and drought, which of course are somehow related to the climate change. Nearly 70% of the Europeans think that the climate change is a very serious world problem, and 25% of the European citizens think that it's the most serious problem we are facing nowadays. If we compare these figures with the figures, similar uh, surveys conducted in the United States, then we, we can see that only 33, one third of the Americans uh, rate climate change as a very serious threat to the world. In 2006, uh, only one third of the Americans actually believed that climate, that climate change was a, a real, uh, was a real and caused by human activity. And even today, there are some, it's not uncommon to hear people on TV and uh, uh, on the radio denouncing uh, uh, climate change. So basically uh, saying that there is no sufficient evidence in order to believe that the climate change is actually going to happen. So why is it so? One possible explanation is that uh, Americans are uh, more skeptical. Uh, there is a funny figure is saying that uh, uh, still today, there is 20% of Americans that uh, don't believe that uh, the moon landing ever happened. It was all uh, uh, a setup, okay? Whereas Europeans are more, uh, they trust more their scientists, okay? I don't know if this is a positive attitude or a negative attitude, probably in, somewhere in between, okay? Anyway, there is this kind of difference. But I think this is not really explaining the, the issue. What is really telling us what is really explaining this difference, I think, is the kind of pressure that has been exerted. And the, the, the kind of pressure that has been exerted the, through the political channel and through the economic channel. The coverage of the issues surrounding global warming differs hugely between Europe and America. Public uh, perception in Europe is led uh, from above. While in the United States, it is public pressure that is slowly causing uh, political to take climate change seriously. In the United States, the climate issue is making a big divide between Democrats and Republicans, whereas in, the, in Europe, it is a cross-party uh, issue, okay? Economic perspective. In the United States, the, the climate change issue is perceived as a major problem for economic growth. Tackling climate change in America is seen as a way of, shift, of stifling uh, the economy, reducing growth, uh, costing, uh, costing jobs, and limiting industries' ability to make money. Whereas in Europe, from an economic perspective, there is an opposite, an opposite view. In Europe, the climate change is seen as an economic opportunity. Okay? 
which will open new doors for trade and industry. This is the reason why there have been so much investment, public investment, into new renewable uh, energies, subsidies, uh, incentives, and so on, for all these kind of new technologies. So, to get to conclude my talk, I think that we are heading towards a sixth wave. There has to be a sustainable wave. And I think that, again, a major role is played by the so-called landscape level. Okay? That's why politics is so important. Okay? And this is going to happen through the two channels I was telling you about, an economic channel and a political channel. So I think that there is a really a big, there are big changes ahead of us, and I think that we can make, we can make uh, a difference into this uh, change. Thank you very much. So if you have questions, I'll be happy to um, answer you. Uh, what current steps is the EU taking to uh, help tackle sustainability? Uh, <laughs> it's putting, as I said before, it's putting a lot of money into uh, research, for example. We are now, we have now this uh, Horizon 2020 call, which is a, a scheme for uh, funding uh, research, networks of research across Europe. And uh, it's, uh, one, the, the key areas are uh, uh, related to the environmental, uh, to environmental uh, improvement in terms of sustainability. For example, there are calls about uh, waste, and uh, they are putting a lot of money in incentivizing research on uh, waste valorization, electronic waste, uh, organic waste, um, food waste, whatever. And uh, they are putting a lot of effort also in establishing networks across uh, different institutions and um, research and uh, firms, small and medium enterprises, large firms. So they are really putting a pressure into this. This is a way of putting pressure, okay? If, you, if I put the money in this area, okay, I will attract research on this area. And this is a way of putting pressure. What else? So with the paradigm shift, uh, shifting to a more bio-based economy instead of a fossil fuel economy, will that full paradigm shift happen the way the trends are going before or after we are dangerously low on fossil fuels? Meaning like, are we going to run out of fossil fuels first and then the paradigm shift will fully happen? Or do you think the transition will happen before then? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, what we know about uh, fossil fuel uh, is that uh, it's going to finish at some point, but uh, estimation on when it's going to happen are very um, uh, broad. I mean, they are not precise. We don't know exactly when it's going to be, when it's going to finish, for two different reasons. One, it's because uh, the way in which we are using fossil fuel is becoming um, more, uh, we, we are reducing the waste of this. And then there is a second issue that is uh, associated with the fact that we are discovering also new sources. But what is sure is that uh, as we discover new sources, as, as time goes by, extracting fossil fuels is becoming more and more expensive. Okay? So the question is not whether it's going to finish, when, it, when it's going to finish, but when it's not going to be economically worth to extract it and use it. When we, when we are going to have something that is going to replace it, which is going to make, which is going to be economically um, more valuable, okay? How do you think the greater push on sustainability has affected European lifestyles? I think it did have an impact. Uh, I was recently visiting the States. Uh, I was uh, in New York and Chicago. And um, it was really impressive to see the differences uh, across uh, European lifestyle and uh, uh, American lifestyle. Uh, what, was, uh, what most impressed me is, for example, the fact that you have uh, 30 degrees outside and then you enter a shopping mall and there are 18 degrees there and you have to wear a coat because it's very cold. And this is, of course, uh, 
consuming a lot of energy. And this is something that you don't have in Europe uh, anymore. Okay? It's becoming less and less an habit. Uh, there are small things that are um, setting a, a difference. Um, for example, the uh, amount of food waste is also, uh, the result, there are also differences in the amount of food waste, the quantity of food that are uh, sold. For example, now more, it's more and more common to find a single portion uh, 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 salad in uh, shops, in supermarkets, which means basically that they don't force you to buy more than what you really need, so you will uh, throw away less. So this is, these are changes that are actually uh, affecting the affecting uh, behaviors, like consumers' behavior. Then there is another issue about consumers' behavior, which is uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, social acceptance of this change. And uh, this is also a big issue if you think about uh, uh, waste valorization. Because we really need to get uh, to the idea that uh, what is waste, what is a wa waste now, it's actually a resource. And this starts from consumers. Uh, are we ready to eat in plastic uh, dishes made of waste, made of food waste? Are we ready or not? Or do you th do, do, will we think that this is not uh, healthy for, uh, for us or it's not good enough for us? So there are some issues associated with consumers' behavior that uh, have been addressed. Some others still need to be addressed. And uh, re research on this uh, area is uh, quite active. Could you just give um, comments on something that perplexes me in, in your presentation? Um, it seems to me that at the base of biotechnology, an important thing has got to be genetic modification. And yet there's an incredible difference between the US and Europe in, in the average view of these technologies. In Europe, for instance, uh, genetically modified food is um, abhorrent, and yet in the US it's acceptable. And it seems to go contrary to the broader statistics that you were citing earlier. Yes and no, because uh, the view on genetically modified uh, organisms is changing also in Europe now. And uh, I think that uh, what we really should uh, do is uh, valorize the waste rather than having dedicated crops uh, for producing uh, biomaterials, for example, or chemicals. So uh, it would be a, a more of an issue if you think that we need to grow crops on this, so we need to maximize the output that you can uh, harvest from uh, production of uh, dedicated crops. But I think that uh, really, in order to make a, a significant change, uh, there is a, a resource which is now completely dismissed, which is waste. And this is, uh, has got a double green effect, because on the one hand you will uh, solve the problem of uh, what to do, how to dispose of all this waste, and then on the other hand is uh, actually uh, providing an answer to use uh, to make uh, bioproducts, uh, chemicals, uh, and anything from uh, waste rather than having to uh, produce uh, new, uh, uh, new crops. But then on the other hand you would say, but you still have to feed the people, the population, in order to make, all, in order to, uh, which will produce this waste. Yes, this is true, but I think that uh, statistics are telling us that uh, if we work also on food loss, for example, which is making a big part of uh, the story, then there is, uh, as it is today, there is uh, enough food uh, to feed uh, the world population, even more than what we need. The problem is that we have a lot of loss, and. Uh, there is a, an issue of distribution as well. So I don't know if this is answering your question, but... That, that genetic modification could hugely reduce pesticide uh, use and so that the traditional production of food could remain maybe the same, but there would be less fossil fuel inputs because there'd be less use of pesticides. But it seems that just the idea of genetic modification in Europe. That, that's why in lots of countries it's just banned in, within Europe and it isn't the sale of modified, uh, genetically modified food in, in the States. And that, mm. that seems a very big uh, difference that goes contrary to the general view on sustainability and climate change. I, uh, I mean, I mean, I'm not an expert on genetically modified uh, 
organism, food and whatever. But uh, I share the view that it's probably the European uh, position is more of uh, an ideological position on this. And I think that uh, it's probably, as I said at the beginning, it's probably uh, changing now. Uh, slowly changing. Also because there is, uh, we, are, we are eating genetically modified food because we're importing it. So there is no real, uh, it's difficult to make a, to put a ban on genetically modified food or genetically modified organisms because it's, it's in so many things that it's really difficult to trace all the uh, supply chain and uh, make sure that uh, everything uh, that you will buy in a um, European supermarket is 100% uh, OGM free, which I think it's uh, genetically modified uh, organism free, which I think it's not, uh, it's not feasible. And as I said, I think it's more of an ideological stand. So thank you, Professor Morone, and thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much.